Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Road to Hope and Peace. Uh, our Facebook page is sponsored by the Utah Orem Mission of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I am uh, Gordon Treadway, the president of the Utah Orem Mission, and uh, I'm hosting tonight's Why I Believe Fireside with Hank Smith. And uh, as you can see, joining us here with, uh, with me is, is Brother Hank Smith. Uh, Hello, President. Good to be with you. Hanks, we're so grateful that you're here tonight, um, and we're grateful for all the people who are joining us live now on Facebook on the Road to Hope and Peace. Uh, Hank, as you know, we've been, we started this um, uh, devotional series about a month ago, and, and uh, we're just super excited that you have the time to, to join us tonight here in the Utah Orem Mission. Yeah, well, I wouldn't miss it. If it has to do with missionaries, I will not miss it, so I'm excited. Awesome. Awesome. Well, for those of you who uh, have been living in a cave and, and uh, don't know much about Brother Smith, let me tell you a little bit about Hank Smith. Um, he is a Southern Utah guy. He grew up in St. George, Utah. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. St. George. I learned to drive in the heat. There you go. If, yeah. you, if you learn to drive in the heat, you can handle the snow and ice, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, but um, he uh, went to college and got an MBA at Utah State University, and then uh, went a little bit further south and uh, got the P got his PhD at the other blue university in the state, mm -hmm. <clears throat> at Brigham Young University. Um, a teacher, a speaker, an author of several books, including Be Happy and uh, Running Down Your Dreams, which, um, which brings up a question, Running Down Your Dreams. You're also a little bit of a marathon runner, I understand. Is that where that book's title came from? It's, yes, but it's just because I like to eat out a lot, and so I had to I had to do something so I could keep my habit of eating at Outback Steakhouse. Or... I appreciate that very much. How many marathons have you run, Hank? Uh, twenty one, I think. Marathons. Twenty one, wow. yeah. But that that I, back when I was fast, uh, it's it's it sounds better than it actually is. It's really <laughs> Well, after two, after two marathons myself, I said, okay, that's, that's enough pain. <laughs> that's because you're smart. Yeah. You're <laughs> wise president. <clears throat> but, uh, but obviously an accomplished runner, anyone who runs 21 marathons is either, either hates himself or really likes to exercise <laughs> and eat out, but we're grateful for that. Um, Hank also runs to keep energy. He's married to his beautiful wife, Sarah, and they have five children, including twin boys who I believe are your youngest. Is that true? That's it. Yeah, baby four and five. I got some pictures to show. All right, good. Well, you just need to be a, uh, <clears throat> you need to be in shape to be a dad of five kids. So we're grateful for you, Hank. And uh, we've already said an opening prayer, everyone. If you do have questions tonight and would like to ask those questions, please feel free to message us here at the Road to Open Peace. We will be monitoring questions tonight, and uh, at the cl close of the program, we'll be answer having uh, Hank answer some of those questions. So again, thank you so much. We'll turn the time over to you, Hank. Oh, President, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, everyone. If this has to do with missionaries and teenagers, these are my favorite groups of people to spend my time with. Uh, I just hope that I can do something that will that will help you, that'll help you feel good, help you uh, encourage you, help you um, get closer to God. Uh, all of those things are really in my heart. I just hope they come across here tonight. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, and I have a, uh, uh, I, I just want to introduce myself a little bit and show me, um, show you my family. And by doing so, kind of have you think about your family a little bit. Let me bring Zoom back up so I can share that screen. So uh, I just have a, a few family pictures to show. All right, I bring that up right there. Okay, uh, so this is my beautiful wife, Sarah. I absolutely adore her, my friends. It is this short of idolatry. I really, really like her. Uh, we've been married 20 years, uh, happily married 20 years, uh, and it seems like it's gone by in seconds because I'm just so in love with her. I'm, I'm quite a romantic kind of guy. I don't know if you, any of you have parents that are really romantic, one or the other. I'm really romantic, the poems, the flowers, things like that. But the funny thing is, is my wife is not romantic at all. Uh, the other day I sent her a really long text. She had to scroll through it. Uh, there was emojis and there was, you know, poems. It was just really a beautiful text. I, I took some time on it and uh, I saw the little bubbles come up after she was writing back to me. I was getting excited and she wrote, um, she wrote, thanks. 
uh, uh, not even the full word, just THX, just thanks. And I, I said, when I got home, I said, Sarah, really? Just thanks? And she said, it's weird. I don't, it's weird. I don't want to write that stuff. It's cheesy. She said, if you love me, do the dishes. If you love me, clean the car. And I'm going, I can't do those things because I'm over here writing you long poems, right? But it works. Uh, we've been happily married 20 years. This is our oldest daughter right here. Um, for a while, it was just the three of us. Those of you who are the oldest listening to this, you'll realize that they're, uh, the life of the oldest child is really different than the life of the youngest child. Those of you who are the oldest, you went to the doctor more than all the other children combined. Uh, the, the oldest one, you always just think you break it. You're like, uh, if she fell off a chair, we better take her to the doctor. And the doctor says, no, she's fine. I hate to tell you this, but the, the last child, I'm sure he's been to the doctor at some point. Uh, the other day he fell down the stairs and I'm really sad about this, but neither my wife or I moved. We're so used to this now. Uh, we leaned a little bit and he went, oh, we're like, he's conscious. He's fine. It's just a completely different world for the youngest child. Uh, this is Maddie now. She loves to take my phone and take pictures on it. Uh, if any of you look at the person next to you and ask them if they have uh, taken their parents' phone and taken a picture on it. Don't, I don't understand what the what the draw is to that, but it seems like every kid I've talked to is like, yeah, I take weird pictures of myself on my parents' phones for them to find Later, I'm not sure what that's about. Uh, this is our second child. For a long time, we didn't know if he had a neck. Uh, he's a very, very big baby. Uh, this is the day he is born. I am not joking. This is the day he is born. That's his three-year-old sister, two-year-old sister holding a brand new baby. This is the next day. No, just kidding. It wasn't the next day, but uh, it was a couple of days later. Anyway, uh, this is Mason now. Uh, and he is our second child. He loves to be surrounded by girls. If any of you have teenage brothers who love to be surrounded by girls. Um, and he, uh, he does not like to be compared to his sister. Uh, Madeline is pretty amazing. She read the Book of Mormon 70 times yesterday. And I said, he said, well, don't compare me to Madeline. And I said, listen, I'm sorry if I compare you. I'll try to stop. But you don't have the hardest life ever. Because uh, he was saying, well, Madeline's perfect. No one can be like Madeline. And I said, well, did you know that Jesus had a little brother named James? That's a true story. In the New Testament, Jesus had a little brother named James. And I asked him, how would you like to be James? Can you imagine the pressure of being Jesus's little brother, right? People are like, what can you do? And they're like, I'm trying to be like Jesus. I bet James wrote that song in primary. I'm trying to be like Jesus. And you look at the bottom, it says lyrics, James. All right, uh, this is our third child. Uh, he never looked like this. He mostly looked like this. He's just kind of a sad kid most of the time. Pretty angry. He's my redheaded boy. Um, now, uh, he's downstairs, so I better not say this too loud, but he is by far the most difficult child in our family. I don't know if you guys have a difficult child. If you do, don't look at him. Don't look at him right now. If you have a difficult child in your family, don't look over at him. Uh, if there's a mess, he probably made it. If there's a fight, he's probably in it. He is a great child. I love him when he is asleep. Uh, but he is sometimes really, really difficult. Uh, and that's okay. That's okay. Because the other children prove that we're good parents. We always wanted to have four kids. It was always our goal to have four kids. I don't know why. We just always thought, well, let's have four kids. And so we had a girl and a boy and a boy. And what we wanted at the very end was a baby girl. And what we got was two more boys. This was kind of a joke. It wasn't fair. Uh, this is not what we ordered. If you go to a restaurant, and you order a meal and they bring you the wrong meal, you can send that meal back. It doesn't work that way with children. Uh, the chef would not take them back. So we got both of them. Uh, here's another one of them right here. That one on the right, watch his face really closely, you guys. His face doesn't change. It scared us at first. We said, is he okay? And the doctor said, take it home. So we took him home and eight months later, he's got the exact same face. This is where things got a little weird because my wife said he looks like Megamind. And I was like, he does. He looks just like Megamind. Um, but having twins kind of changed our whole world. We seemed like we, we felt like we knew what we were doing when we had three kids and then four and five come on the same day and it kind of throws your world uh, into a complete craziness. Now, I wanted to show you all seven of us here. Uh, and the reason I, I like to show this picture is, you know, most people would see this picture and say, oh, what a happy family. And we are a happy family, but it's far from perfect. We live in a telestial world, right? And so telestial worlds have telestial problems. But um, it is, it's, with the gospel, it is uh, happy. We have a very happy family um, and things are, things are going well, but we do have our fair share of problems. 
Um, I wanted to show you something that one of my heroes taught. Her name is Julie Beck. Uh, she was a leader in our church uh, when she was uh, uh, over the Relief or Relief Society organization. And she said something very simple, but it really changed my life. She says, if it is, if it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ. Uh, and I remember hearing that, and it was such a simple statement, but it was something I'd never thought of before. If it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ. Because occasionally, I meet teenagers, you know, I, I speak all over uh, the country in schools and in churches, and um, occasionally I'll meet a teenager that says, uh, Dr. Smith, I am never getting married. I am never having kids. I don't want to have that. I want to travel. And I tell them, hey, I get to travel a lot, and traveling is a lot of fun. Uh, in fact, traveling, if I want to describe it exactly how it is, it's a lot of waiting in line. That's what traveling is. Uh, it's a ton of waiting in line. Um, but then I just let them know, you can still travel and have a family. In fact, when it, when it comes to comparing the two, traveling isn't even on the board anywhere near close as fun as it is to have a family, even an imperfect family. Uh, there, there's nothing that comes even close to being a husband and to being a father, to being part of a family, nothing even close. So can you see why the enemies of Christ would want to get rid of families? If it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ. So watch the shows that you, um, that you support, watch the websites you support and see if there's any sort of anti-family message in them. Um, and I know you, uh, those of you listening, uh, you have the dream one day of having your own family. And what does that say about you, right? If it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ, and you want to have your own family one day. And you should want to have it because it is by far the best part of life. I'm sure President would agree. The best part of life. Ask your parents what the best part of life is. They won't say their job. They won't say their calling. Uh, they won't say their front yard. All those things are really nice, and uh, they, they have to spend a lot of time on them, but it is not the best part of their life. You are the best part of their life. I know some of you are like, if I was the best part of their life, why would they ground me? Well, sometimes you have to ground the best part of your life to make sure it's safe. Uh, but we, your parents, uh, for the most part, your parents absolutely adore you. I know some of you are thinking, well, Hank, I don't come from a very happy family. That does not mean that your future family can't be happy. That doesn't mean that you can't have all that you dream for, uh, dream of in a, in a future family. So I just, I have to send that message to you that this is where uh, I have found the most happiness by far in my life. Uh, there is nothing even, even close to it. All right. I want to um, talk about family history here for a second. So I was doing my family history the other day and I ran in to my great, great grandfather. I know. Uh, it scares me too. I was looking at him and I said, okay, wow. Um, if I, I'll be honest, if I saw my great, great grandfather Smith here, if I saw him on the street, I would run away. And I know some of you are thinking, Hank, you're kind of judgmental. Yeah, probably, but I don't know if that's contagious. He, of all people, should be wearing a mask, right? So I, um, I was like, ooh, I just don't like this. My wife came by and she said, that's got to be your great grandfather. I can't even tell the difference between. I said, thank you, sweetheart. That's very sweet of you. Uh, and then she said, no, no, no. You just have to change your perspective a little bit. And she turned it for me. And all of a sudden, it was no longer scary for me. It was nothing. It wasn't something I would avoid. If you look really closely there, you're going to see a little dog. He's curled up. He's got his nose against his tail. Uh, he's got his eyes closed. Right. Hopefully you can see that by now because I can't see you. I know some of you are at home going, I can't see it, but president can see it. So I'm guessing that all of you can see it as well. See, what I saw was something to avoid. I saw something that I should get away from. My wife saw something that wasn't that scary at all. I've noticed that, that when we meet difficulty in life, there are some people like this, and I may be one of them, where I try to avoid all trials and all difficulty. I just am like, run away. I am one of those people, and uh, I, I hate to admit this, but that, uh, I've tried to make deals with God before saying, God, don't give me these type of trials. That's going to be too much. Uh, I'll take these, these, and these, right? But don't do these over here because I, I don't think I could handle them, right? I think I'd, I think I'd just, I, I, I would have to give up. I'd have to quit. Um, but there are other people who seem to see difficulty as something different. Maybe they don't welcome it into their life. Maybe they're not like, yes, give me difficulty. Although there was a man, you've probably heard his name. His name is Spencer W. Kimball. He said something that just floored me. 
he said, uh, whenever I hear of a great trial, a difficult trial, I think, Lord, give me this mountain. And I'm like, what? I say, Lord, help me go around this mountain. Help me avoid this mountain. Because he sees trials as something that could maybe even benefit or bless his life. And I'm going, how do you get to be that way? Well, I want to I want to just give you some different perspectives tonight that might that might help you just kind of shift your perspective on difficulties. So you've probably heard this story before of Jesus walking on water. I don't think this is an actual photograph, but I've never actually spoken to the photographer. Now, uh, this story is found in Mark chapter six. Um, it's found in uh, three out of the four gospels. That this is my favorite. Uh, this is my favorite version. Mark says he told his disciples to get into a ship. Uh, and he is going to go talk to the people. And then he talked to the people and he went to, uh, into a mountain. He went up on a mountain to pray. So by the way, Jesus took time for himself. If there's any moms listening tonight, it's okay to take time for yourself. Even Jesus took time for himself. Okay. Now at six o'clock, look at this verse 47, when even was come, that word even eventually becomes the word we call evening. Uh, and it basically means 6 PM. At 6 p.m., the ship was in the midst of the sea. He was alone on the land. Now, look what it says. At 6 p.m., in verse 48, it says he saw them toiling and rowing. He sees them struggling, right? Toiling means working. They're really, this is really hard for them because the wind was contrary unto them. So they're trying to go into the wind. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to row into the wind before, but this is a difficult thing. And the Sea of Galilee isn't, isn't an ocean by any means, but it's, it's pretty big. If you've ever been to like Bear Lake in Northern Utah, it's a very big lake and you can get some pretty big storms up there. Well, uh, he sees them. And then it says on the third line of verse 48, about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. Now, verse 47 was at 6 p.m. The fourth watch of the night is 3 a.m. They've been out there for nine hours. Even They could be out there even for more because the fourth watch goes till 6 a.m., 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So nine hours at least they've been out there rowing. When's the last time you went to the gym and you thought, I'm going to go on that rowing machine. I'll put in a good, I don't know, nine hours. Nobody does that because it's exhausting, right? You would be, you'd be dead. They've been out there rowing for nine hours. They've got to be scared. They've got to be wet. Uh, they've got to be exhausted. And he comes walking on the sea. Nine hours they waited. They see him walking on the sea. They suppose it's a spirit and they cry out, right? Because you got to think, how exhausted are you? Uh, you've been up all night. You, any of you have ever pulled an all-nighter before? You're starting to feel your brain stunt, not starting to, you know, it's not working like it used to. Uh, they cry out, so they're terrified, right? Think a haunted house, scared. You see a spirit come walking on the water in the darkness. They all saw him and were troubled. That's my favorite word of the whole thing, troubled. As if when you're terrified, the one thing you say is, I'm troubled. Try that. The next time you're really scared, turn to the person you're scared with and say, I'm troubled, right? And see if they're like, what? <laughs> you can say, I read the Bible a lot. All right. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and he said unto them, now I want you to write these four words down. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer, he says. That literally means to you and I, cheer up, smile. It's okay. Be encouraged. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Now, we're going to do what Nephi said to do, and we're going to liken the scriptures to us. How many of you have been troubled in the last six months? Even a little bit, you've been troubled, right? And uh, you're exhausted. You're tired. And maybe this is lasting a lot longer than you thought it would, right? Uh, I remember talking to some missionaries um, and youth, and they thought, well, if I can, I, can, I can do this whole quarantine thing for a week or two. Right? Do you remember a week or two? That was that was that was moons ago. A week or two, right? We're we're going on months now, uh, working on uh, over a half a year. And you might be thinking it's the fourth watch. I am tired. I'm exhausted. And if we're quiet enough, I think we might be able to hear the Savior say, "Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid." Now, when he says "it is I," I think he's talking about the thing they're seeing. They think is a spirit. But couldn't he be me? Couldn't he be? Um, couldn't he be saying the whole situation is him, right? It is I, meaning the wind, the storm, the whole setup is all me. It's all me. I'm doing this for a reason. It is I. Be not afraid. I know this isn't news to you, um, but uh, I'm going to say it to you anyway. This whole historic year, uh, 2020, 
um, is, is incredible. It's absolutely incredible to be on the earth at this time, experiencing this. No one saw it coming, but the Lord did. This was not news to him. He wasn't sitting in some celestial room drinking hot chocolate when an angel came running in saying, there's a virus on the earth. We don't know what to do. What? Everybody get back to work. No, the Lord knew this was coming long before uh, you were born. He knew this when you were getting, those of you who are on the, in the mission right now in the incredible aura mission, he knew you were going to go to the Orem mission in the middle of this. He knew that. He called you anyway. He moved forward anyway. He sent you out in the midst of the sea anyway, right? Uh, and if we can, if we're quiet enough and we, we calm down, we can hear him say, be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Elder Holland said this. He said, this counsel, be of good cheer, is not a jaunty pep talk about the power of positive thinking. So the Lord's not just going, hey guys, I know you're about to drown, but be positive. No, that's not what this is about. He said, Christ knows better than all others that the trials of life can be very deep. And we, some of you really need to see this. We are not shallow people if we struggle with them. I can't tell you how important that is to realize. If you have struggled in your life in the last six months, if you have struggled, you are not shallow. It doesn't mean you have a weak testimony. It doesn't mean you had that you have a distant relationship from God. It means you're what scientists call alive. You are a human being and being alive means you are going to struggle. Your testimony will help you through your struggles. Your testimony will help you understand your struggles, but your testimony was never intended to make it. So you didn't struggle. I've had, I've met missionaries and people in my life in the last six months who have felt guilty for struggling. So now they're not only struggling, but they're feeling guilty for struggling. And they'll say something like, I thought I had a good testimony. I thought I had a close relationship with God, but this has really rocked me. No, you can have a very close relationship with God and still struggle. We are not shallow people if we struggle. But even as the Lord avoids sugary rhetoric, that's another word for pep talk, he deplores pessimism. Now that's an interesting phrase coming from Elder Holland. The Savior deplores pessimism. Deplores means like think of something that you you cannot stand. Think of something that makes you kind of gag a little bit. For me, it's sprouts. If you put sprouts on a sandwich, I just can't eat it. There's something about it that just makes my whole stomach and mouth want to get rid of it. I just, I just cannot do it. I deplore sprouts. Well, I know this is going to sound odd, but if you want to make the Lord gag a little bit, be pessimistic. He deplores it. Now, what well, some of you are like, well, what's the difference? What's the difference, Hank, between struggling and being pessimistic? I can tell you what the difference is. Struggling is going to the Lord and saying, Lord, I've had a hard day. I've had a hard week. I've had a hard month. I've had a hard six months. That's struggling. And that's okay. Going to the Lord and telling him, hope you know, I've, I'm really having a hard time. That's struggling. Pessimism is, Lord, I'm having a hard day, a hard week, a hard month. And every day I've ever had has been hard. And every future day is going to be hard. I might as well buy litter because I'm going to die alone with cats. I I have, my life is terrible. It's miserable. I never should have come on this mission. I shouldn't go to high school. This is awful, isn't it, Lord? Do you see the difference between struggling and pessimism? He expects us to believe. He goes on and he quotes another apostle. I call this apostle inception. When an apostle quotes another apostle, he says, I love what elder Orson F. Whitney once said. The spirit of the gospel is optimistic. It trusts in God. It looks on the bright side of things. That's the whole point, right? It's the whole point. When I was talking to President Treadway, the idea of like, we're, we're teaching, we're, we're baptizing, we're, we're doing great in the mission field. That's the spirit of the gospel. It's optimistic. It trusts in God. It looks on the bright side of things. Now, this is the whole point of the quote I wanted to show you. We should honor the Savior's declaration to be of good cheer. Indeed, it seems to me we may be more guilty of breaking that commandment than almost any other. It's not a pep talk. According to Elder Holland, be of good cheer is what? It's a commandment. How many of you have broken that commandment in the last couple of days? I know I have. I need to repent. If you're sitting next to your mission companion, I hope you are, turn to them and show them what be of good cheer looks like on your face. Show them that you're keeping that commandment. Don't do it creepy. Don't turn to them with that slow smile, but turn to them and smile. Show them be of good cheer. That means when the alarm goes off, be of good cheer becomes a commandment, right? That means when uh, when things go badly, right? When I had a lesson planned with someone and they, and they, 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 they just ghosted us. They turned us down. I can't find them. We are supposed to be of good cheer. 
right? Now that doesn't mean we don't see problems. It's okay to see problems. It just means we don't allow our heart to become hardened. I love what Bruce Hafen once said. He said, the trick in life is to not live life with your eyes closed saying there's no problems anywhere because I can't see them. Well, just open your eyes. There are problems everywhere. He said, the trick is to live with your eyes wide open, but your heart wide open as well. The trick is to see the problems, to see everything, the difficulties we face, yet still choose from our hearts to be of good cheer. Let me show you a verse in Alma that I really like. No one ever reads it because it's at the very end of the book of Alma. And this is Mormon speaking. And Mormon is writing about the war. And he says, um, his name is Mormon, by the way, not Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So don't think I'm sinning here. His name is Mormon. Uh, he writes, because of the great length of the war, between the Nephites and the Lamanites, many had become hardened just because of the length of the war. It wasn't exactly that the war was the most intense it ever been. It was just drawn out. It just seemed like to be never ending. The length of the war, many had become hardened. And I can see why. When I go through difficulty that I feel like is lasting a long time, sometimes you get so tired of hurting, you just kind of harden your heart against pain. But the problem is when you harden your heart against pain, you kind of also harden your heart against joy. And so you just kind of get hardened and angry, right? And he says, because of that length of the war, but let, look at the next phrase. And he says, many were softened because of their afflictions. Insomuch they did humble themselves before God, even in the depth of humility. I highlighted those two sections. Many had become hardened and many were softened. And I think if Mormon is embedding a principle in this verse, I think he did it on purpose. I think he's saying, look, when you go through something long and difficult, you have a choice to make. You can kind of do the default human thing and become hardened. How many of you have ever become hardened before? It was just too hard. And it's not that you lack faith. It's just you got tired of hurting. And so you hardened your heart and said, I'm just, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to be tough. I'm going to tough my way through this. I'm done feeling. Many had become hardened because the war, this trial was just so long. Many were softened. It seems to me he might be saying, you got to make a choice here. If you don't make a choice at all, you're going to go right to the default. You're going to go hardened and angry. But if you choose, you can choose to be softened. You can humble yourself before God, even in the depth of humility. I don't know exactly what that looks like, the depth of humility. I've told my wife that I'm the most humble person I know, and she never agrees. But I, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I know it may look something like this. Going to the Lord and changing your questions instead of, Lord, why me? Why this year? Why my mission? Lord, what do you want me to learn? Lord, not my senior year. Lord, how can I use this? to help you? How can I, this is such a strange year to be a, you know, sophomore, junior, senior in high school. Wow. What, this might be an incredible opportunity for me to do something for you. What do you want me to do? Do you see the difference between why me and what do you want me to learn? Why me? And what do you want me to do? That's where all of a sudden we become energized because the Lord's saying, yes, finally, yes. I, there's so much to be doing right now. People are so open to hearing the gospel instead of sitting down here and complaining, let's get up and move. These, there might be people in your high school, in your junior high, in your college, there might be people that are ready to hear the gospel that never would have heard it seven months ago, but the world has changed so much, they're ready. But are you ready? Okay, well, I wanted to, um, I want to share with you a little parable, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up and, and we'll take some questions, but I want to share with you a little parable, um, and it's a true story. Most of you already know this story, uh, and as I'm telling you this story, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to uh, just draw out, this is kind of like listening with your spiritual ears. I want you to draw out kind of lessons for you personally. So I'll tell you the story and I'll try to help you draw out those principles. Um, this right here is the Provo Tabernacle. It was built in, get this, 1886, not 1986. 1986 was a long time ago. That's the last time BYU won a national championship. I'm talking 1886. This was for ever ago. 1886. Do you know who spoke at this building very first? John Taylor, the John Taylor, the one that was shot in, you know, shot four times in Carthage jail. He spoke in this building to dedicate it. It served as a meeting house of the church for 126 years, longer than any person lived. It served faithfully 
as a, it was a, a stake center for state conferences, for firesides, for concerts. It was a faithful building. And then in December of 2010, no one ever thought it could happen, but there was a massive fire. And the fire basically gutted that old, beautiful building. And a lot of people thought the church would tear it down or the church would sell the property because it's right in downtown Provo. Now, I'm going to do something odd since we're talking a, a parable with lessons here. I'm going to give this building thoughts and feelings. I would like you to just go with me on this. I know it's a little bit odd, but let's say this building sees the destruction of the fire and says a prayer like this, Lord, why would you do this to me? I have tried so hard to be good. I've done all that I've been asked to do. I've, <sighs> do you know how many boring speakers I put up with? Do you know how many children have thrown up in me? And I have not complained. I have been good. And yet this is what I get in return. There are other buildings on this street that deserve this. Why would, it, why would you do this to me? I'm, I feel hollow. I feel empty. I feel, I don't even know. I, I'm questioning everything I believe. I, oh, this is really, really hard. Why would you do this? Now, I know that's odd, and some of you are going, oh, poor building, but go with me on this. President Monson uh, stood up uh, in April of 2011, and he said, oh, no, no, we are going to rebuild the Provo Tabernacle. Now, one of the major problems with rebuilding the Provo Tabernacle was the foundation. It was 126 years old. That's an old foundation. It was not going to meet standards for 2011. The problem was, uh, how do you replace the foundation when the only thing left of the building is sitting right on the foundation. Six million pounds of bricks sitting right on the foundation, but it's 126 years old. Um, I'll tell you, they asked a friend of mine, his name is Mike. He and his company, uh, they are in soil and foundation work. I know some of you are thinking dream job. Yeah, soil and foundation. Uh, they decided, uh, they were asked by the church if they could replace the foundation on the Provo Tabernacle without moving the building, to which my, my friend Mike said his company quickly responded, no, it's too old and too big. It, you can do that on other buildings, but this one, there's no way it could withstand that pressure. He said after a series of meetings and talks, Elder Uchtdorf um, was, was meeting with this company and he just finally said, well, Mike uh, and company, we believe in you. And he went, what do you want us to do? I mean, they said, we think you'll find a way. Uh, I asked Mike, how did you do it? And he said two words, very carefully, very carefully. He said it was absolutely miraculous because uh, 16 months later, he said we had replaced the foundation with a steel frame, something I never thought possible. He said his company won awards for this. Uh, it was something that was just a dream to be a part of. Now, this is the part you're not going to believe me because this is a great story if it ends right here, but it doesn't end right here because he said that the first presidency uh, and President Monson specifically said, what would you think about putting in a basement? My friend Mike said, we thought they were joking at first. They had to be joking. We can't put in a basement. We've, we've just done the impossible. Putting in a basement would be astronomical. There's just no way. The building's 126 years old. It just wouldn't be able to stand it. Well, he said, once again, we basically got the message from the first presidency, which was, we believe in you. And he said, Hank, we belong to the church of Jesus Christ of, let's just do impossible things of Latter-day Saints. Let's just do impossible things. Um, I remember he, he told me, I said, how did you do it? And he just kind of put his hands up and he said, Hank, there's no YouTube video for this. There's no textbook. There's nothing. If we're going to do this, we're going to be winging it because no one's ever done it before on any building that any size. He said it was absolutely incredible to be a part of because it took, he said it took him almost two years and they had the entire building 45 feet in the air, 6 million pounds of brick, 45 feet in the air as they worked all the way around it. He said, we were getting calls from all over the world. People saying, how are you doing that? Is that really what it looks like? Are those pictures doctored? He said, no, we're really doing this. We were winning award after award after award. We were doing basically what anyone in my industry, Mike said, would have thought 100% impossible. No one would have believed it could happen. Now, the final product was not the rebuilt Provo Tabernacle, but the brand new Provo City Center Temple. Now, I'm going to put two of these buildings side by side. Look at the building on the left, uh, just a few days into construction, and the building on the right, the day of dedication. 
Now, I want to go back to this prayer, but I want you to do me a favor. I want to, I'm going to go back to the prayer the, the building said. But you're, in this case, you're God. And you can see the building on the right. You can see the end from the beginning. You know what it looks like on dedication day. And yet you hear it pray, why would you do this to me? I've tried so hard to be good. There are other buildings on this street that deserve this, not me. I'm questioning all that I believe. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think. Now, if you're the Lord and you know what the building is on the right, how would you answer that prayer? You'd probably first be very sympathetic, right? Empathetic. I know you're suffering. I know you're hurting. I'm so sorry. But then you'd have to add a feeling of, but be of good cheer. It's okay. You should see the future. You're going to love it. You're going to love what I have in store for you. And the only way you're going to get there is by going through this. So just don't give up. Don't quit. Keep going and believe that I can see things you can't. Believe that I can see a future in you that you can't. I remember Joseph, Elder Joseph B. Worthlin, who some of you, you're too young to remember him, but he was just the greatest speaker. He'd, 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 he'd shimmy up to that pulpit and he said, the Lord just doesn't see us as we are today. He just doesn't look at us that way. When he looks at us on the earth, he not only sees us, but he also sees the final product. He sees the glorious being you're going to become. And so when we pray, Lord, why are you doing this, right? You can almost hear him say, be of good cheer. I can see the end. It's okay. Oh, by the way, did you know that one painting survived the fire? One single painting survived the fire. And it wasn't even the full painting, just that piece. That is the only piece that survived the fire. Coincidence? Probably. But I still like it. I still like this idea that in the middle of the fires of our lives, he stays. Even if we cause the fire in our lives, sometimes we make choices that, you know, really take our life up in flames and he still stays. He sits right there with us in the middle of this destruction, sometimes caused by us, sometimes caused by others, sometimes just caused by being alive, right? He sits right with us. I think you'll see as the events of 2020 continue to play out into 2021 and 2022, I think we'll all look back and see how God was there the whole time. At times we thought, where's he gone? He's abandoned us. He's gone on vacation. No, he's been there the whole time. Just sat right in the middle with it. But we come, sometimes can't see it until we're looking back on it. I've noticed that on trails. Sometimes on hiking trails that I'm on, I can't really see where I'm headed until I get far ahead and I can look back. And then I can see how it all made sense, why the trail took the turns that it did. But I just had to keep going when I was in the middle of it, even though I couldn't see what was ahead. Well, I have a, you know, the most important witness we have of the Lord are his apostles. Um, I believe them, they and their spouses have significant responsibilities and blessings that come when they bear testimony of him. Now, hopefully it's come across to you that I, I love the Lord and I have a testimony uh, that he is central to our church and our work. Um, hopefully that's come across. Uh, but these testimonies that I'm going to read here are even, are, I would say, much more important uh, for you to hear. This is President Henry B. Eyring, He's, who says, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, the hardest as well as the easiest times in life can be a blessing. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the hardest times of your life can be transformed into a blessing because of him? This is Dallin H. Oaks. He says, he knows of your anguish and he is there for you. He knows of this depression, this anxiety, learning disabilities. He knows of what it's like when your specific parents are getting a divorce. He knows what it's like when you go through that, you know, that medical problem. He knows of your specific anguish, not just all anguish, but your specific anguish. And he is there for you. He stands ready for you. And this is the most important thing you're going to hear tonight. We have a prophet on the earth today who said there is only one in whom your faith is always safe. There is only one in whom your faith is always safe. You can always trust him. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. President, do we have time for some questions? We do. Hank, thank you. I, I just felt the spirit so strongly as you spoke and loved that. Loved your message tonight. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
message with us. I think it was so appropriate for the times we're all leading, living in. Let me, um, let me just go uh, to everyone out there who's watching. And by the way, we're just thrilled. Hank, you'll be glad to know that um, uh, at least as we were monitoring it, over 1,200 people uh, oh, wow. are watching us live right now. Wow. And that number was, was going up throughout the hour. So more and more people uh, joining us throughout, which is just a great sign and people obviously resonating with your message. Oh, that means so everyone out there, as, as, you're, as you're watching, if you have a question for Hank, please put it in the comments of the uh, of Facebook Live right now on the Road to Hope and Peace. Just write in your question and we'll do our best to answer those, uh, ask those questions of Hank here in the last few minutes that we have with him. One of the questions, Hank, is, is this, as you talked about the incredible story of the Provo Tabernacle and the Provo City Center, now, now the Provo City Center Temple. I love the metaphor and the parable of that, of that building. How would you, how, what would you say to a 15 or 16 year old, uh, a teenager in today's incredibly uh, secularized society? How do they start their faith? How do they make that decision where they feel like, okay, I feel hollow, I feel empty. Where do they begin? Yeah, what do I do? Uh, that is such a good question. I am... Um... Uh, you know, I was a teenager back in the 1900s, so it was, it was a while ago. Um, you remember the 1900s, President. It was, it was a while back, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I remember feeling that way. I, I remember wanting to know, you know, if, if I was, if, if God was aware of me, uh, if I mattered. Um, and it wasn't until... Well, I, I'll, I'll just tell you, I, I was probably, I don't know, 15, uh, ninth grade. What is that? You know, 15. And I was, I was on a, I was on a, a walk. My dad used to do the strangest thing when I'd go over to my friend's house or anything, he would, I'd say, Hey, can you come get me? And he'd say, yeah, start walking. And I never, I still to this day, don't know why he'd do that, but he'd say, start walking. And so I'd start walking and maybe he just wanted to give me alone time because it would take him about 20 minutes to get there. And I, I would walk all by myself, kind of in the dark. This is back when you could do that. I think probably a little bit more and no phone or anything, just walking by myself. And um, I remember one night as I was walking, I was really wondering about my place. You know, I could see the stars and I was really wondering about my place in, in the plan, in my place in existence. And, um, as I was sitting there, just pondering that, I wasn't really asking any questions of God. I wasn't saying, hey, is the church true? Is the Book of Mormon true? I was just kind of pondering my place. Uh, I was overcome, overcome with a feeling that I had never felt before, nor created by myself. If I could create that on my own, I would keep creating it over and over. Um, but I was, uh, I was absolutely overcome. And I felt something, I think what the word I would use now, I wouldn't have used this word then, I wouldn't even known this word then, uh, but the word I would use now is um, transcends, it's transcendent, it transcends your ordinary daily experience. Um, now, since that time, I've felt that same feeling, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, but it was the first time that I felt okay, I wasn't hollow, I wasn't, uh, I didn't feel empty, I felt, I felt a rush of purpose and excitement um, and now I seek that same feeling. It was almost like planted in me. And the Lord said, now you can seek it. Now you know what it tastes like. Now seek it. And I seek it in things that, uh, where I know it is. I seek it in, um, in pondering. I seek it in reading uplifting literature. I seek it in wholesome relationships. I seek it in scripture. Uh, sometimes I get bored in scripture, but sometimes I, I, can, I can continue to feel that feeling. Uh, and so wherever I find that feeling, I just continue to seek it wherever it is. And uh, that to me has been, um, I think the beginning was, I, I just had a little taste of it. So when you get those little tastes, maybe in prayer or in, you know, a church meeting or something, you get a little taste of it, keep seeking that taste. Uh, and it eventually will become more of a common thing that happens in your life. That was kind of a longer answer, President. I don't know if that was... Uh, the great answer. Thank you for that. Um, I, there, I got a message from uh, Cherie, I think is how you would pronounce her name. And Cherie 
asked a, a poignant question. She said, you know, sometimes I feel really alone. How do I find peace and how do I find hope in, in, a, in a time where I just don't feel like I know anybody and I just feel really, really alone? Oh, my goodness. Sharice, wherever you are. Oh, man. Um, my heart just goes out to you because that I, I have felt that same way before. Uh, and it is a draining um, it is a draining feeling. Um, so first, you know, when I don't feel good, when I feel alone or lost, I, I, I like, and maybe I'm too much of an attacker. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm a kind of a problem solver in that way. I'm, I don't really like to sit still and, and, and ponder it too much. I probably should do that more, Sharice. But one thing I personally like to do is attack these things. Uh, and so I've found that those who, who, um, and uh, the word attacks, maybe not the right word, but, um, who try to take different facets of life and, and go after it. Um, so one side, let's say would be a physical way, um, making sure that I'm eating healthy and that I'm getting enough sleep and that I'm really taking care of myself physically, right? Ding dongs and a Mountain Dew every day for lunch is not going to make me feel good right? Then I'm going to attack, I'm going to try to attack it socially. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to try to reach out to people who, who, you know, I think can, can fill me up and, and make me feel better, right? If I have parents or friends or teachers or counselors or young women's leaders, I mean, there's so many people, you just have to look around and go, there's someone who makes me feel good about myself, um, I'm going to reach out to them, I'm going to talk to them about my, my problem here. And then I'm going to attack this, um, I'm going to attack this spiritually. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to, I'm going to read about it. I'm going to search for answers about this, this thing, right? And maybe even we add emotionally, where if I'm in a really dark place, I'm going to go see a counselor. I'm going to journal. I'm going to write about these things. I feel like those who attack their problems from multiple sides have a, have a better chance of, of finding that of finding an answer, finding a way out. But sometimes, Sharice, and this is maybe the most important thing, sometimes the process we go through of just enduring through a period of life that's dark, sometimes that process of just making it through each day, it shapes us. We can't tell, but it shapes our character. And then one day, Sharice, you're standing up in front of a, a group of teenagers or a class or something, and you can teach in a way that you could not have taught had you not gone through that experience. There's something, there's some wisdom that you're gaining. I still want you to attack it. I don't want you to just sit and say, well, I can't do anything about it. You can, but sometimes the process of just enduring and searching for answers in the middle of adult difficulty shapes us into a person that the Lord can then use in different, in different ways to bless countless lives. Yeah, I love it. Thanks. Thanks, Hank. I got, we've got a question here from Aiden that I think is, is uh, something that most of those who are watching tonight can really relate to. Okay. He's talking about how, how we stay strong in our faith and in our hopes and in our beliefs uh, when we're changing so much as, as young people, as youth, uh, as teenagers, we're changing and growing and trying new things, including our faith. And sometimes in those changes, it gets pretty discomfortable, right? It's hard and it doesn't feel right at first. And, and Aiden's question is, how do we stay strong in the process of changing for the better, even when it's uncomfortable? Wow. My goodness. President, who are these young people? These, <laughs> I wish I would have asked these they're, questions. There are a lot better young people than when we were right. young people. I, my, my major question when I was younger was probably like, how do I get Amanda to, to really look at me? Right. Like, <laughs> so it um, was pepperoni or sausage. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like what, what's, what's this? Is, so I, I, I love who you are. Those of you who are asking these questions, just the fact that you ask these questions, uh, is an indication of who you are, uh, what kind of soul and spirit you, you have. Um, I would probably say if, if my own child came to me, I have a 16 year old daughter, I have a 13 year old son, and they, and they're starting to experience some of these, some of these, you know, feelings of like, you know, this is part of, it's part of growing up. 
Uh, this is part of, you know, it's going to make you a good parent. This is what's going to make you a, a wise friend one day that can give, you know, wonderful advice is, is going through this process. Uh, I personally uh, have just noticed that when I go back to the unchanging things in life, um, the Lord's life, for example, I love to study the Lord's life. I teach at this little school in Provo called BYU, and I teach the four gospels and the Lord's life never changes. Um, his, his incredible parables, his incredible teachings. Uh, I can keep going back to that over and over and over. And even though I'm changing and adjusting, I can find like an anchor there. And it feels like, you know, maybe I'm, I'm moving around a little, moving about, but my anchor is holding me right there. Um, I think uh, the Lord provides us with some stability in the in the church. He provides us with some stability in prophets and apostles. I haven't, if if you watch General Conference, the messages don't usually change all that much, right? There, you consistently get talks on unity and repentance and doing good things, right? And so, as you kind of attach yourself to the church and you attach yourself to the scriptures, essentially attaching yourself to the Lord, He is unchanging, and that gives you room to grow and to, uh, you know, because you know, you're firmly attached to him, um, then he'll, he'll give you the, he, he's the one guiding, he's the one guiding your growth. He's the one, um, you know, having you go through different windows of opportunity, different doors of opportunity. So, uh, Aiden, I would say more than anything else, attach yourself to him. And part of this, I would assume, is you trying to figure out who he is, where he is, and, and what he's doing. Uh, and as much as I would love to hand you a testimony of Christ, um, the process that you're going to go through, I'm sorry to keep hitting this, but um, it is a fun one. It's a difficult one, but man, that road to Christ, especially when you're young, is a beautiful, <laughs> is a beautiful and fun and adventurous and difficult road. Uh, so I'm not going to take it from you, even if I could. Uh, but once I found him, uh, I found stability uh, and yeah. I found um, real growth. Yeah, I, 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 let's talk about that for just a little bit, because as I was listening to you, I was thinking about the fact that you said you'd run 21 marathons. Yeah. So between the two of us, that means we've run 23 marathons. <laughs> Thank you I like for the way doing you so much President. more. <laughs> So between the two of us, we've run 23 marathons. And, and I don't know about your experience, Hank, but um, when I started running and training for my first marathon, it seemed like I would never be able to get there. Yeah. When you're, when you're running that first or second mile and you haven't run before and it hurts and you're exhausted and it's really, really uncomfortable, Aiden. Um, but as long as you can keep the faith that if I stick with this and keep running one and two and then three and then five, sooner or later, you're going to not just, you're going to run 26 and you're going to, and you're going to look back and go, that was worth it. Don't you think just I, stick with it and keep, the I faith. remember the first time my doctor said, well, you better start running. I'd hurt my shoulder. And he said, you better start running. And so I said, okay, I'm going to become a runner. And I ran point two, three. <laughs> and I turned the machine off. <laughs> I was like, that is far. 0.23. My wife says 2.3. No, not 2.3. 0.23. Um, and there six months later, as I, like I said, as I just, like you said, if you keep just adding a bit at a time, just don't quit doing what you know you're supposed to do. Like well, I would run every day or every other day or whatever it was. Uh, I finished that 26. It was incredible to see it just build up a little over time. Uh, and it's, that's the Lord tells us what over and over, he says, I'm going to give you a little bit at a time, uh, line upon line. Uh, he just is not a flash flood knowledge kind of guy. Most of the time, mostly it's just a little here, a little here. I'm going to advance you a step at a time. You almost, it, it almost goes so slowly. You almost can't feel the progress until you Tell you compare yourself looking yeah. back quite a ways, right? It's perfect. Yeah. Aiden and anyone else who's feeling the same way, don't give up. Yeah. Just keep at it. All right. We have time for one last question, Hank. Okay. This one comes from Nicole. Um, and, and she's asking for a friend. She says, how do I help a friend who struggles to hear answers to prayer? Oh, that is such a good question. I have a long time to 
I have a long answer, but I don't have the time to give it to you. Um, so I'm going to give you the short answer. I, the scriptures teach that God speaks to man and, and, and woman, mankind, uh, in their own language, in their own language. And, and to me, that just doesn't mean English and Spanish and Japanese. It also means that God can speak through your natural surroundings, things you naturally enjoy. Some of you, um, God speaks to you through music, and some of you, God speaks to you through athletics, and others of you, God speaks to you through through academics, right? Really learning. And other people, it's God speaks to me through, you know, um, through my parents and this relationship, this incredible relationship that I have. It's just every, every, everybody's language is different. And so often we want what somebody else has in their language. So someone might say to me, Hank, you know, I really feel uh, in the scriptures that I, that God speaks to me through the scriptures. And so I go into the scriptures and I can find myself a little bit frustrated because I'm just not hearing that exact language. It's there, but I'm just, it's not cluing in, uh, keying in to, to me. And so one thing I try to do is, uh, or it's one thing I have done in my life is I've realized God's been speaking to me the whole time. I just didn't realize he was speaking my language. Uh, I was looking for somebody else's language. And once I figured out what my language was, uh, and I'm still figuring it out, Nicole, just so you know, this isn't a Thing you just get down, but I'm, I'm much more, I'm further along the path than I ever was. Uh, when you start to see he's speaking my language, he knows me and he's, you know, he's speaking to me through, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. Um, then all of a sudden uh, it's like tuning into a, a radio. They probably did. They don't have to do that anymore, President, where you have to turn in, tune into a radio. They don't know what, what you're talking about. Yeah, they're like, what do you mean? I just press the buttons and put it on the right one. But if the idea is like, um, it's like getting on the same signal, right? Uh, and so he's the one saying, I know your language. Let me send this out to you. And then I'm the one that has to adjust and listen and, and be quiet and hear. I think the one thing you can do for your friend is let her know that, that, you know, God speaks to you in your own language. So what do you feel like your language is? What are your natural abilities and loves, right? She's got, she's probably already like, well, I have this great relationship with my mother, right? And then that might be like, oh, he has been talking to me the whole time through this, this channel that I have. Uh, and the other thing is to let her know what your languages are and say, yeah, God speaks to me oftentimes through writing. God speaks to me oftentimes through, you know, a certain church leader or whatever it is. Um, and then let her know that there's, there's a variety of opportunities out there. There's a variety of ways that God speaks. We just can't corner him into, well, I'm going to pray and then wait for, you know, I'm going to wait for angels to come. There's the, the view, the vast array of different languages God speaks is different for every one of us. And it's fun to, to search it until you, you can kind of hear that. You can hear it all of a sudden for you. The connection is made. And th those are beautiful moments. So tell her to what President said before, just don't quit because the day will come uh, when you go, wow. It's, it's, it, I, the best word I can think of tonight is it, it transcends human experience. It mm -hmm. really does. It really does. Beautifully said, as, as usual. Hank, um, we are so grateful for your wisdom and the spirit you've brought to this devotional tonight. Thanks, Thank you for your time and, and for your faith and, uh, and for the gift that you have to, to share it with other people. For those of you watching, uh, we're so grateful that you took the time to be with us tonight on the road to hope and peace. We're thrilled with the amount of people who came and stayed throughout the entire program. And uh, just so you know, this will be now available on the Road to Hope and Peace. If you missed a piece and you want to come back and watch it in just a few minutes, this will be posted live on the Road to Hope and Peace. Please share it with your friends. Uh, we know many of you are in the Youth Battalion here in, the, in Northern Utah County. Those of you on the Youth Battalion, please share this with, uh, with one of your friends tonight. Just hit the share button and let them know that, uh, that you heard something or felt something tonight that really changed uh, maybe the way you feel about your relationship with God. And I think most of all, I think the message that we all take from this is uh, Christ is there for us. He never leaves us. Don't give up seeking to hear his voice because he really, really wants you to hear it. 
So everyone, thank you so much again. Hank, to you, you're awesome. Have a great night. Enjoy your family. Thank and you, everyone President. Else, God bless you. And uh, we'll be back again with another Why I Believe devotional in roughly uh, one month. So, so stay tuned and keep watching us here on the Road to Hope and Peace. Good Thanks, night, everybody. Good night.